This morning I'd like to share a little bit around vision. Uh, not necessarily the vision for this place, but having vision. And I, I would love to take you back for this series into where we've come out of the cave and talk a little bit again around Elijah. And, and Elijah took his eyes off the call and focused his, everything around himself. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10 says this, Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And I'd love to notice a few things around that. There's a lot of eyes in that. All of a sudden, when you lose vision and you start to lose your way, as Elijah did, you start to declare, I, I, I. I, I, it's all about me. We start to blame others. You know, there's Elijah saying, it's not my fault. It's those silly people of Israel. And they've done everything wrong. But so often when we lose vision, we, we try and blame other people rather than, being accountable for ourselves, just as Elijah has done. One of the glaring issues for me is this actual scripture was a conversation with God himself. Now here's Elijah actually saying this to the creator of the universe and saying, it's all about me and it's all their fault and you're not big enough to fix it. But how often do we say that? How often do we go, oh God, you're not big enough to do the things that I need? Rather than saying, hey, it's not about me, it's about others. And we know the promise of Scripture is when we turn our eyes outward, God does things. We know that it's not about what other people do because we're responsible for our own actions. And that God can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think through the power of God working in us. If we can catch it, it'll help us stay out of the cave. When the challenges in life come and Elijah had just had this incredible challenge, had this incredible victory, and then he's had an incredible challenge come and the challenge was with himself. It's easy to think that we're the only one and everyone else is at fault, but I've found that that's not really helpful for me. And I don't think it's helpful for any of us. You see, Elijah missed the fact that God had more for him to do. He actually reached a peak in his prophetic life, in his life, not pathetic life, prophetic life, because it wasn't pathetic. Anyone could do what he did is pretty incredible. But he lost the vision, he lost the focus, he lost the purpose that he was called for, thinking this was the end rather than he had a lot more to do. And what he had to do was actually build up other people around him and he had to build up Elisha. And probably more than that. But he lost his heart and he lost his vision and said, I want to die rather than saying, hey, who, what is the next step in the vision? And sometimes I think as people, we can, we can lose the step in our vision. And I see it with leaders of churches. I see it with leaders of countries. I see it with leaders in general, people in general, as they get to the point and they go, oh, well, what's next? And not realizing that God has more. Because there's something about the prophetic we need to catch and grab hold of. God's prophetic vision for us, because God has more. If we are still alive and breathing, God has more for us. He does. There might be an end of a season, but the beginning of another. And sometimes we think the end of the season is the end, just like Elijah thought. The end of my season is the end. I'm the only one left, God. You see, God's got a prophetic vision for every person in this place. That you're fearfully and wonderfully made, created in the image of God for a purpose. For a purpose. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And I've written this out of the Amplified this morning. So where there's no vision, no redemptive revelation of God. Don't you love that? 
No redemptive revelation of God, that God wants to redeem us, that you've got a vision that God is for us, not against us, that God has this, this heart for us, that we are redeemed. And not only once, we are continually being redeemed. And thank God for that. We work out our salvation with reverence, fear and trembling, the scripture says, to redeem us. But prophetic vision is so important. Without it, the people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, enviable, is he. Without prophetic vision, people perish. Or there's another version that says, people cast off restraint. Now, I don't know about you. When I lose vision, it's easy for me to cast off restraint. When I forget the reason I'm here, when I forget the, the, what the purposes of God are, it's so easy just to be like Elijah and go, well, woe is me, and it's all their fault. It's all Moira's fault, really. <laughs> She's not here this morning. She's in Sydney. But how often do we say that? And I'm sure Moira says it's all his fault. And rightly so sometimes. But it's so easy to blame somebody else. It's so easy to, when we lose vision and we lose that, we start to lose a thing called hope. And hope's so powerful. We have to hold on to hope. You see, we need to have a vision. I was reading Good to Great again, and there's a book, Good to Great. It's a business book. It's about businesses that are, that are doing really well and how they've gone from a good business to a great business. But I love one of the statements that it says this, mediocrity has robbed many of the zeal to lead an extraordinary life. Mediocrity. It's so easy to be me mediocre, isn't it? That's like the rest of the world. Let's just be mediocre. But that's not where God wants us to be. That's not where we want to be. None of us are happy with mediocre. God wants us, God calls us to actually be great. That's why I love that scripture, fearfully and wonderfully made. Because God's fashioned and formed you for a purpose. And it's so easy when the troubles of the world come, when something disappoints you, when there's been an event in your life that becomes an anchor to your life and stops you, that because we lose vision and we lose hope. But God always wants to plant vision and hope in each and every one of us. See, as Highlands, we've got this vision to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That's, a, that's the heartbeat of Highlands. We want to lead people to Jesus. We want to lead people in the growing relationship with Jesus. It doesn't, it's not just, oh, well, I've been there, put my hand up, got a you, matter t-shirt, I'm done. But we want to grow in our relationship with Jesus. That God has so much more for us. But you see, that requires a vision. That requires God to, to expand inside of us what God's calling us to do. The thing I love about the cross, and we come to the cross, is we are redeemed at the cross. We are forgiven of sin. The guilt of sin leaves us. By his stripes we are healed. All the promises for us at the cross. Incredible. But everything past the cross is all about others. So interesting. That at the cross, it's all done for us, but it's done for a purpose. Others. And that's where we find our success. That's where we find our, our, our self-esteem. That's where we find our, our, who we are in God. That's where we actually find what God wants us to do as we lean into what others want. That's where marriages work, where, where we lean into our partner's need and, and desire and we build them up. And as, as people give 100% to each other, their marriage blossoms or relationships blossom or friendships blossom. Not when we, ah, oh, well, I'm just going to do what I have to do. And the heartbeat is that we grow in our relationship with Jesus means that we grow in our relationship with others. By this all men will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. As we grow in our relationship with others. 
We stated another way that we know God, find freedom, discover our purpose and make a difference in life. To know God, not just know about him, not just know of him, not to be great theological giants, but to actually have a great relationship with the creator of the world. How do we test our theology? By how we love others. That's how we test our theology. Oh, no, can you got to go to the Bible? Yes, we do. We should read it. But it should read us. And how we love others. To know God. To find freedom. We do, if we find freedom when we find it with other people. You see, we only reason, the only way we know we're free is when we're with others. Because if we're still bound when we're with others, that's what brings up that challenge. That's why when we rub up against others, as it's called, that it knocks the sharp edges off us, sharpens us. That's what the others do for us in our life. That's how we find our freedom. That's why our small groups are so, so important, why small groups are a critical part of our church. We have community there where people can pick us up when we're down or we can pick others up when they're down. We can celebrate the wins together. To discover our purpose. Everyone in this room has a purpose. Everyone in this room is important to the kingdom of God. Everyone in, in this room is important to the church. The church being the, the ecclesia, the movement of people in the world, that we all have our place and our purpose. We're not just in church just to have a religious experience, but we're here to have a purpose. And the purpose is to change the world by dealing, being a dealer of hope to a hopeless world. That's how we make a difference. When you look at everything we do in this place, I look at what we do in the ministry of our college, in our early learning center, making a difference. I look what we do with Red Frogs, with our kids program that's going on right now, with our teenagers that come in on a Friday night, making a difference. Life changed. I look across this room and I see people that come through the school and have come through and have had opinions while they've been in school that Christianity's strange and I'm not going to be one of them and then I see them in his place even today worshipping Jesus because all of a sudden it's not about the religion it's about an encounter with the living God to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus it's so important we understand why we're we're in this place we're in this place because you matter you matter to God and you matter to us. And you matter, see, that can be taken as a lovey-dovey statement, but it's a not, it's a growth statement. That we matter so much to God that he would die on a cross for us, but to grow us and give us a purpose. Sure, he dealt with it all at the cross, but he gave us a purpose. That's what you matter means, that we're not just here and just for, oh, well, my time on earth, what I'm, what. What on earth am I here for? And how, how many times have you said that or you've heard it said? But we're here for a purpose because we matter to God. I think about that. I think about the fearfully and wonderfully made when you think about and look at your fingerprint and go, it's different to everybody else's. Isn't that incredible? A simple thing like a fingerprint. There's no one else in the world got that. A funny thing was, you know, with fingerprint, when Apple de developed the fingerprint thing for the phone, remember that? Now it's I, if you look into, the, into it. I'm sitting at the front of the church and Max is sitting next to, young Max Cameron was sitting next to me and uh, he put his finger on my phone and it opened. <laughs> Obviously Apple haven't quite got that algorithm right. But it's incredible to think that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that everyone's DNA is different. But it's not just that we're different, we're different for a purpose. See, all these statements we have are about purpose and growth. It's why we do what we do. Think about how we do it. We do it with discipleship. 
discipleship, community and worship. What we're doing today is worship. We come in to praise the living God together. There's something incredibly powerful about the corporate worship, the encounter with God. As we turn our, away from ourselves and put it on the, to the creator of the world and we encounter his presence and the touch from God. It's incredibly powerful. But actually, when we think about the process of discipleship and community to worship, discipleship is actually just being a good friend. Because somehow we've made it complex over the years where I've got to have a a 12-step process to evangelizing people. (laughs) When actually it's just being a good friend. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. All of a sudden it becomes easy, doesn't it? It's not, about, it's not about relational evangelism or anything like that. It's actually just about being a good friend where people go, man, you're different because you're a good friend. And every Christian should be marked by that, that we are good friends. We look different to others because we're a good friend, because we're generous, because we're people who have a passion for people and a passion for God. Being, bringing people into community. That's why I love our small groups that we have community. And sure, there's times where we study scriptures together and do different things in our small groups, but more importantly, it's about the love and care for one another. Being there for people. Being a place, a safe place that people can come on a journey, a safe place to belong before they believe, a safe place to actually come up close to a Christian and go, well, you're not that weird after all. Because a lot of people think we are. But we're actually not. To come into that community is so, so important. You see, when we talk about coming out of the cave... We talk about knowing God, that keeps us out of the cave, and a vision, the prophetic vision, keeps us out of the cave. Community, where we've got others that are there for us and where we can unpack our life or unpack our world, gives us that place we can walk on. You know, I'm involved in a small group that I started 10 years ago. It's with business people. And business people come to that small group and we can share about the challenges we face and talk about business and Talk about that. And some days we just drink coffee and eat a good breakfast. And other days people will say, hey, I've got this challenge and we can pray through that. Because that's what community is meant to be. It's not meant to be something that's weird. It's meant to be something that we enjoy together. That's why vision's important. That's why the vision of this church is important. It's why we jump out of bed every day if you're on staff in this place because the vision calls us out of bed. But how about yourself? How's your vision? What's your vision for life look like? Incredibly challenging because I find this, most people's vision is so small or so narrow when I talk to them and and they See, I see why they struggle as I talk to people outside the church and their vision is, oh, well, I'm just going to go to work and go home and retire. There's no vision that's outside of themselves. You see, a vision is your anchor that keeps you out of the cave. Your vision is your anchor that holds you out of the cave, that stops you from drifting. It's why the scripture says, without prophetic vision, people run amok or cast off restraint. But what's your vision like? Because it's really important that we have a vision. It's really important we catch a vision for ourselves, our family and our future. I think it's so important that we should actually write it down and keep it in front of us. One of the things I've found, and if you look at that, that quote from good to great about mediocrity, one of the things that, limit, that can limit us is that good is acceptable. Oh, we can, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a good life. Wouldn't you like a great life? The good becomes acceptable. I think about what we do here as a church and 
If you know some of our other statements, if we're not the best, how do we become the best? If we are the best, how do we get better? It's not a prideful statement. It's actually about the becoming and the getting. If we're not the best, how do we become the best? Because we're called to be the best. The vision should speak that we call us to be the best for God. That we build an irresistible place, the place that people come in and go, that's not what I expected. I'm radically challenged by this when we look at the school. And as you know, probably know I've been working in uh, primarily getting buildings built in our, in our campus here for the last couple of years. And people have opinions around that. People had opinion around the, the church building we built. Why would you need to build a big church building? Because we want to build a place where people can come to worship God. We want to build a place that's irresistible. And if it's got resistibility in it, how do we remove it? Does that mean we're perfect? No, it means we're becoming. Because I'm sick of Christians being called second rate. Where you walk into a, a church and people go, oh, well, that's just Christian. Or they do a, you know, I don't know, I've been around church since all my life, actually, which is a long time. But some of it's been mediocre. Some of the stuff I've seen has been not the highest quality. And I've heard people say, oh, well, that's just the church. It's not who we should be, but it's not who we should be as people. Mediocrity shouldn't be acceptable. It's not acceptable to God. He says, what are you bringing me a second-hand offering for? You can read it throughout Scripture. Why are you bringing me a speckled calf or a speckled lamb? He's talking, about not what, he's talking about mediocrity. It's not our best. He says, bring your best as an offering and I'll get involved in the rest. I think about building our school. We know we've got a good school. It's a good school. But we want a great school. We don't just want to be a good school. We want to be known as a great school. We want to be known as an excellent early education centre. You know, we're exceeding at the moment. We've got an exceeding rating on our early education. Now, that's great. There's another rating above that called excellent. We want that one because we want to bring glory to God. We think about our school. We don't want to go down there and see buildings not finished or buildings. We want to see it complete. We want to see the paths painted. We want to see all the little bits that actually makes it better, that pushes us to become great. Because all of a sudden it builds something inside of us called school pride. And we want that. We want to be the best. Unfortunately, the same is true in our daily lives. We give credence to the norm while beholding greatness as a lifestyle exclusive to a few people. Yet you're called to be great. Isn't that an incredible thought that God picked you? He picked you for a purpose. I remember when I was, before I was born, my mum was sick. She had bad kidney trouble. Had stones in her kidneys and I was the fifth of child, the last child, the spoilt one. Kept talking to all my siblings, I'll tell you that. They're right. You know, all mum's friends said abort him. The doctor said abort him. You don't need another one. You hear Doug's story, it's a very similar story. But you see, God picked us. My mum gave me over to God when I was in a womb, said, I, I give him over to the ministry. That's my excuse why I'm here. She didn't tell me that till I was in Bible college. You see, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, created for a purpose. You're not here by a mistake. You're not in Australia by a mistake. You've been picked up and placed here for the children, for yourselves. I look across this room and I can see people where God's picked you up and placed you here because you are in this place for a purpose. 
to make a difference in the world. To be a church, not just a church that's mediocre, not just a church that's here just to fill a space on the corner of Human Spring, but a church that's a body of people moving forward to make a difference in the world. That's what we're called to do. That's the vision. That's what forces us to get up in the morning. But what's your personal vision? What is putting you to get out of the bed in the morning, jumping up and say, I'm here for a purpose today. Habakkuk 2.2, I love this scripture. It's always a scripture I learned when I was first came into Pentecost, but it's always stuck with me from the first time I've heard it. Write a vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run Who reads it? For the vision is for an appointed time, but in the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And I I love that. I love that if we grab hold of the vision of God for our life, but most importantly, write it down that we see it, because the pressures of the world come. The challenges come, don't they? The reality is you may go to the doctor and they'll give you a challenge. I went to a doctor, as you know, what was it? last year, year before, and he said, there's nothing I can do for your shoulder. It knocked me around for a couple of days. But I thought, I'm going to lose all the movement in this thing. That means I can't do what I love to do. I can't do the things that restore my soul. But I got a vision. Because I prayed, God, give me a vision for this thing. And the vision I got, which I love, was pulling a motor out of my, one of my cars. I've got, I like cars. I pulled it out yesterday. <laughs> but hey, maybe you're in this room and maybe said someone said something over you. Maybe you've been in a circumstance that's just put you, stopped you. Maybe you've got a diagnosis that said, You're not going to make it. Can I encourage you to get a vision? Write it down so you see it every day. Write it down. Let it speak to you. There's something incredibly powerful that goes on with our mind and our gut. I was talking to Michael during the week, our principal, and we're talking about the brain, I've been doing a lot of work around brain and thinking about brain and how, we, how our brain works and the connection between the brain and the gut and that actually in our gut is part of our brain, which is so interesting to me. And a person was having trouble with digestion and went to see the doctor and they gave them antidepressant for their gut. He said, what am antidepressant? He said, the guy said, the doctor said to him, no, no, that's because we need a, some medicine around our gut because it's actually part of what's in our brain. So important that we grab hold of the vision and let it speak and take us through. You see, when I see people retire, I see them lose hope. I see when biz people sell a business and move on and they have this dream. I had a dream of being a millionaire when I, by the time I was 30. A million dollars was a lot of time, a lot of money in those days. I sold it to Boyer and she married me. <laughs> you see, you've got to have this vision because it keeps you on track. When people retire... When people sell a business, some of them lose hope, they lose purpose because that was their vision. Their whole vision was their work. And you've got to have a vision outside of that. The vision of what your purpose is in this world. That's the prophetic vision of God. One of the best ways I know to keep me on track in vision is I ask myself this question. I really encourage you to get a question like this for yourself. What would a great leader do? When you walk into a circumstance, when I walk into a circumstance, a situation, what would a great leader do? In my marriage, what would a great husband do? 
And I think about my kids and my grandkids now. What would a great dad do? What would a great granddad do? Because all of a sudden it takes them out of mediocrity of I'm just going to do. But what would someone who's great, what if, if I was to be a great dad, what would it look like? Great husband. What would it look like? Because all of a sudden you can start to build a vision for yourself out of that one question. You think about your circumstances of life of where you are right now and whatever age you are. What would, a great, what would a great student do? It gives you, starts to build a vision for your life that you can actually start to write down. If you think about that and you think about your, each aspect of your life as a, as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as wherever you are in the stage of life and you start to ask that question, what would a great person do in your circumstance? You can start to build a vision. The power of vision is it actually takes you forward. And you can start to dream about something that's bigger than yourself to make a difference in the world. And you know what? That tends to keep you out of the cave. It tends to keep you focused on where I'm going in life. It tends to give you the, the thing that makes you want to jump out of bed in the morning and get on with the day. But what would a great Christian do? When you think about the people around you, think about your opinions, I've got plenty of them. What would a great Christian do? All of a sudden, you start to see people through a different set of eyes start to see people through the eyes of God rather than who they are or how they're acting but how God sees them with that incredible love to make a difference in their life but to do that you've got to know God and in that process of knowing God you find freedom you discover your purpose and you make a difference in the world one of the things I've always found is actually people want to know why they're here. They want to know how to make a difference. And the foundation of that is knowing Jesus. I'd love you to close your eyes with me this morning. Father, I pray for everyone here. Father, that we talk about vision, we talk about being out of the cave, we talk about our future and our hope. Lord, I thank you that you're the one that gives us prophetic vision that you're the one that created us, that you're the one that actually gave us the fingerprint that's unique, the DNA that's different, the eye that's different to any other person, the purpose, the place, our purpose and our place in our world that we live in is different. And you've created us for now, 2022 to make a difference in this world. So Father, I ask you to speak to each and every one of us. No matter what stage we're li at life we're at, that we have this vision that fires inside of us, that takes us through. We won't be stuck like Elijah, who thought it had all finished when he had more to do. But we'll get this prophetic vision that takes us forward. Jesus' name. Hey, just while every eye's closed and every head's bowed, we do this in every service. We do it because you matter so much to God and you matter to us. Otherwise, we'd just be doing a religious service. But friend, do you know God? Or do you only know about Him? Do you know Him? I want to give you the opportunity to know Him this morning, to begin a relationship with Him. It's a simple process. Romans 10, 9 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. In other words, if you believe in your heart and, and actually say, yes, I believe, you'll start this incredible relationship with the creator of the universe. The way we do that here is I'm going to ask while no one's looking around, if that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you've wandered off, but today you've wandered back. 
and give you a hand. What I'd love you to do is raise your hand as an outward expression of an inward decision. It's a bit like I confess, I speak out with my mouth. So right across this room right now, if that's you, you've never given your life to Christ or you're coming back to Christ this morning, I'd love you to raise your hand so I can see it, so I can pray with you today. So look across this room. Father, thank you. Father, thank you for everyone in this room. They matter so much to you. I ask you to touch them and bless them today. Give them a future and a hope. In Jesus' name. Amen.